Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, we've got Lisa Sharp from uh, Meat and Livestock Australia today. I came across her presentations at Beef a few months ago and um, I learned a lot from those presentations. Um, it sounds like she's been in the beef industry for 20 years, but she's only been with MLA since 2015. Um, her background is consumer marketing, product innovation, global strategy development, change management, and she's had um, a number of positions in organisations like SPC Ardmona, Coca-Cola, PZ Customs and Novartis Consumer Health. Also management roles in Kraft Foods and Uncle Toby's. Lisa is passionate about using data and knowledge to better understand consumer needs and how these insights inform opportunities through the value chain. So let me welcome Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon everybody. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to come and have a chat this afternoon. Okay, so um, I'm hoping most of you are familiar with Meat and Livestock Australia, but if you're not, Meat and Livestock Australia is essentially funded by uh, producer or farmer levies. And we work in collaboration with the Australian government and the broader uh, sort of red meat community. And we invest in activities uh, and initiatives that contribute to producer profitability, sustainability, and global competitiveness. Now, we're not um, a lobby body, so you might hear of names like the National Farmers Federation who develop policy and, and lobby government to protect the interests of the red meat industry. That's not Meat and Livestock Australia's remit. We're responsible for research, development and adoption programs to increase our on-farm productivity and right across the supply chain. And we also carry out marketing activities to grow domestic and international demand for Australian red meat. And we do that in more than 100 markets. Uh, and we also look for ways to improve access uh, to those markets. Now, I have an awesome job at Meat and Livestock Australia. I'm responsible for our global marketing, uh, our communications, corporate communications, uh, issues management, that keeps me busy. But I'm also responsible for MLA's industry insights, supply side data um, and demand data. So I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a tour of all of that today. Now I'm gonna start with a few basics just to get us all in the mood. I'm gonna talk about production and supply uh, in, the, uh, in the beef industry. I'm gonna to touch on some of the mega trends and we'll close it all out with what are some implications for brand beef, but more critically, the industry? And, and for those of you who are interested in the industry or, or considering a career, um, what does it mean, particularly from a research uh, perspective? So we could play a quiz game. We have a national herd of 27 million head. And that's actually down, uh, it's actually at about a 26 year low. There's a big split, uh, oh, there we go. East and West and, and uh, North and South. Sorry, my builds aren't quite the same as yours. There we go. That's right, North and South. Uh, and the North has been driving much of our herd in the last 20 years. Now the South typically has higher stocking rates than in the North, though the herds there are generally smaller. And average farm size varies very considerably. In the North, a large farm will typically carry six, 1,600 to uh, 5,400 head of cattle. Well, in the south, you're considered a, um, having a large farm if you've got around 400 to 800 head of cattle. So some really distinct differences, and you can imagine some implications for a service provider like Meat and Livestock Australia in supporting our producers. Um, the heartland of the national herd is actually Queensland. It is the absolute powerhouse uh, for the cattle industry. And one of the reasons I'm actually based up here, I do a lot of work with our big stakeholders and uh, it doesn't get much bigger than the Queensland uh, uh, sort of beef industry. Now, due to the size of Australia, uh, its geographic location and really, really diverse climatic conditions, Australia's home to a range of very different cattle breeds. And they're divided into two main groups, our Boss Indicus and our Boss Taurus. Now, Northern Australia, the red region, is mostly Boss Indicus breeds, and they have this great adaptability to a drier climate and tick resistance. These tropical breeds absolutely excel in their ability to survive and produce under very adverse conditions, including heat and poorer quality pastures. And the types of breeds you might hear of when you think about Boss Indicus, Brahmin and Drought Master. Now in our central or our orange region, we've got a combination of British, European and Boss Indicus breeds. So this is the home of maybe the Brahmin the Brang and, the, and the Brangus. And the southern, our green region, these are the Boss Taurus breeds. They're derived from British and European stock and they're really best suited to those cooler conditions uh, due to that, the fact they have their thicker coats and they don't have that notable hump on their back. And so the types of breeds that you'd see there are Angus and Hereford. 
So what we have here uh, on, on the chart is we have our million tonnes of carcass weight uh, on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis we have the years 1990 through to a forecast out to 2022. Now total beef production for 2018 is expected to lift, uh, 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 lift to uh, just over, uh, sorry, uh, 2.17 million tonnes carton weight and that's it, that was slowly an increase on our 2016 and 2017 levels. Now, increasing carcass weights, uh, uh, which arise, so what we've, what's happening in Australia is our herd numbers are down, but we are increasing our carcass weights, our volume of production. And uh, that has risen 10, uh, 10 kilos per average per head, 2017 and 2016 to some new records. So I hear you ask, where does all this cattle go? So here's our breakdown of what we call our Australian cattle turnoff. So 855,000 head, is live exports, principally to the markets of Indonesia and Vietnam. We then have uh, 2.9 million head going through feedlots, uh, so that's where we would see more of the grain-fed production system. And then we have 7.15 million head slaughtered. And 1.5 million tonnes is exported, with the balance consumed in the domestic market or the Australian market. The Australian market still remains our single largest for beef. And we do have record numbers on feed uh, at the moment. It was record numbers when we prepared this content a couple of months ago, uh, but those numbers have continued to rise, principally on the back of the sustained um, dry and indeed now drought conditions up in New South Wales and Queensland. So you might hear these references to grass-fed and grain-fed cattle. Grass-fed, this means that the cattle is, is raised on uh, natural pastures. Now, but there are variations in seasonal and geographic factors and that can influence the style and the quality of beef. We are seeing um, grain fed uh, growing at a faster rate and now making a larger portion of that turn off. And that is of course again linked to some of those drought conditions, but also consumer preferences. Uh, we find that a grain fed product will typically exhibit more marbling um, uh, within, the, within, the, within the beef. Uh, and delivering a different taste and texture and certainly really coveted in a number of our export markets, indeed Japan. So, on the, so beef is pretty big business uh, in, in Australia, but where do we sit on the league table? So what I have here is a simple chart showing production, a million tonnes of carcass weight. Now we produce just over two million tonnes of, uh, of beef annually, and that's enough uh, for almost 300 grams for every person on the planet. 300 grams, 300 grams. Some of you would uh, smash a steak of 300 grams in one sitting, I imagine. But this only equals 3% of the world's production. And we're really overshadowed by some almighty beef producers. Now, we do uh, export around 70% of our production. And we're consistently in the top three beef exporters globally. And we capture around 15% of the world's exporters. And actually, we stack up pretty well. On the export stage, um, it becomes really significant, particularly when you're looking at value. Australia produces a very high quality, high value product. So on the league table, we're only just behind the US there in terms of our place in the world when it comes to beef exports. So a little bit of scene setting. So where do we export all that beef to? Uh, I was going to build this chart, but I thought we would be here for a little while. Our single biggest export market is Japan. Uh, there is always a bit of a league race between the US and Japan. In the Japan market, uh, we find there is very strong demand for our grain-fed product, but also our chilled grass-fed product. In Japan, our Australian grass-fed beef is queuing uh, a natural and leaner product. Uh, and like many markets around the world, there's absolutely um, sort of a growing uh, interest in what people are, are putting into their bodies and some of the health attributes associated with beef. So we've got a couple of things that are really supporting growth uh, in, in, Japan, in Japan. The US, now you've got a sense the US is an almighty beef producing nation. They've actually had record production uh, these last 12 months. They're, they've actually re, uh, reversed a long term decline in per capita consumption and they're eating their way uh, through the bulk of that product. Nonetheless, Australian grass-fed beef is a really, really important part of a product that's really important in American diets, and that's the humble hamburger. 
So what we find is the Australian uh, grass-fed beef product um, blends really, really well uh, with uh, US product uh, and uh, participates in the, in the manufacturing or the ground beef market. So a very, very important market for us. More recently, similar to the trend I've described in, described in Japan, most beef that is produced in the US is a, is a grain-fed or a, a grain-fed uh, or more intensive production system. The Australian chilled grass-fed product, again, uh, is seen as delivering uh, a more healthy and natural product. Uh, that's a perception for uh, US consumers. And we're really finding um, very, very strong demand for um, Australian chilled grass-fed beef in the US. Uh, so again, really driving some of the growth there. Uh, we've always had a very strong reputation in uh, Korea, uh, and that remains our third largest export market. Uh, We've had some mixed fortunes in China uh, as Access uh, first opened up, uh, chilled Access into China. Australia was one of the first markets in there with beef, uh, principally on the back of our very strong uh, food safety credentials. More recently, other markets such as the US have improved market access into China. Uh, so we've got a little bit of competition there now, but it's certainly a uh, uh, growing and is our fourth largest market. There's been quite a big shift uh, in, the, uh, in the red meat industry. We used to be very reliant on three markets, US, Japan and Korea. And just over 18 years ago, those top three markets accounted for 83% of exports. Now in any business, you don't want to be beholden to just a number of customers. It's really important to, have, uh, uh, to diversify. And today, those top three are accounting for 68% of our export volumes. So still a significant number, but there is, we do export beef to over 100 markets around the world, and we see enormous potential um, in parts of Southeast Asia for uh, high quality Australian beef. So overall, what are the prospects for global demand? So here we've got million tonnes on the uh, vertical axes, and the years again, 1990, and a forecast this time out to 2025. So global beef consumption overall, all producers, has grown 20% over the last 30 years. So from 1990 through to 2017, only seven of those years were not record, uh, records for global beef demand. So very, very strong for demand for beef. Now looking ahead, uh, the forecasts would suggest this is set to continue to grow. And the reason for this is population growth, increasing per capita incomes, growing middle classes associated with those uh, increasing per capita income, along with urbanisation and improved supply chains uh, into a number of those markets. And I'll touch on a few of these things. There are, of course, some headwinds, and I'm going to touch on those as well. Uh, there are headwinds with respect to price and affordability, the rise of competing proteins, including plant-based proteins uh, and some synthetic meats uh, on the horizon, and some lifestyle choices. But notwithstanding uh, all of those positives and a few of those negatives, the overall outlook is very, very positive uh, with beef demands and those records set to continue to tumble. So changing gears, there's a bit of a, uh, a snapshot of the beef industry. As part of my role at uh, Meat and Livestock Australia, uh, I'm lucky enough to uh, have global media monitoring. So at a minimum, uh, most people's alarm goes off at 6 a.m. I have very young children, so I'm usually up before 6 a.m. But one of the first things I look at in my inbox is the media tracking. And what you see on the screen is a really good example of what I've, I'll be seeing through my media, media monitoring and uh, social media feeds. And when you're in the red meat industry, it can be really, really, really hard um, not to respond to your natural instincts, which is perhaps to either attack the critics or to go and defend. What I believe is more impo important and certainly what I encourage amongst my colleagues and indeed anyone in the industry is understand why. Why are we seeing some of these types of headlines? And once we understand why, we can start to think about what does this mean for our industry? What kind of plans do we need to put in place? So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to unpack five um, global mega trends that help to explain some of those headlines and what are those implications for Australian beef. But first of all, what is a mega trend? A mega trend is a global pattern of change in political, economical, 
social, technology or a cultural context. And these produce changes in consumer attitudes and behaviours. Now these cycles of change are not a little fad. They typically have a, um, a sphere of influence that lasts up to 20 years. So the first one I'm going to talk about is more from less. Now we all would be aware that the earth has limited supplies of natural min mineral, energy, water and food resources. And we need all of those things for human survival and to maintain our lifestyles. And it, no matter where you look, there is data uh, revealing that many of these resources are, are being depleted and often at very alarming rates. And at the same time, population growth and economic growth are putting upward pressure on demand. So more pressure on those scarce resources. And what the More From, mega, mega, more from Less megatrend uh, explores is how companies, governments, corporations, communities will discover new ways of ensuring quality of life for current and future generations, but all within the confines of those very scarce natural resources. So that's the big mega trend. And what I have here is a couple of data points to really illustrate that mega trend. We know that consumers everywhere prefer this thing they describe as natural meat. Um, they're aware of this uh, uh, depleting natural resources. And they do have concerns around, uh, many of these concerns are often very closely linked to farming practices, uh, understanding uh, the impact that these can have on the environment. And there are implications uh, for, the, uh, for the red meat industry. We need to be very, very clear uh, to identify what this means for on-farm management, uh, broader sustainability, and the yield from the animal. And we need to leverage every single part of that, uh, of that, of that animal, including manure. And often there's a perception that this more from less trend is a disease of affluence. It's only for those developed markets and those consumers who can afford. Um, and really some of the data sets here show you that even in some of the um, uh, emerging and developing markets, these are common concerns. They're really, really common concerns. So one of the ways um, consumers are, uh, are indicating this is they are looking for those products that are natural and they're also looking for uh, some of those uh, products uh, that are making uh, some claims, not greenwashing, but some claims around sustainability. So again, just another data point, this is actually from uh, the US and this notion of sustainable practices, we're really seeing that uh, reflected in sales data. So what we have here are uh, year on year sales growth in a number of products that are making claims. Claims around uh, uh, more natural packaging material, animal welfare claims, the types of production methods employed, uh, and more broadly, uh, sustainable farming. So it's the first mega trend, more from less. Natural, unprocessed, sustainably produced products. This sort of takes me into this next trend, which is called great expectations. So we know that consumers are aware of this more from less or these scarce natural resources. But this trend actually takes us a little bit further than that. It actually explores the rising demand for experiences over products and the rising importance of social relationships. And by this I mean that consumers are increasingly looking to make ethics-based purchasing decisions. They want to choose products, not just for the sensory experience or its delivery, but products that align with their values and their beliefs. Okay, this is very, very important. And we can see this because more and more consumers are demanding transparency and traceability. They want to make considered purchasing decisions from brands, or products, industries, uh, where they feel there is a, a strong values alignment. Now, it, in increasing numbers, but particularly with our millennials uh, and those that gen uh, the generation younger than the millennials, um, this group is really driving the charge to these ethics-based purchasing decision. This group expect companies to be honest and responsible, and technology is now so very, very powerful because we have ways of exposing those organisations that are enga engaged in, uh, in unethical or dishonest marketing practices. Okay, so very, very important. Great expectations, um, this shift towards more ethics-based purchasing decisions, 
and technology has really fueled this, this mega trend because we can all find out about the food we produce, how it was produced, who produced it. And in this world, there is no space for greenwashing. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, we would see large companies making all sorts of claims about their practices. Um, you would be a fool to go down that path uh, in, in this day and age. And just some examples of how this trend is being fueled by, uh, by social media and uh, mobile commerce. Probably the, um, the example I like to talk to because there's a very practical implication uh, for, for, for marketeers, uh, for anybody who wants to succeed, particularly in export markets. Um, again, we often think that only those people who can afford uh, can afford um, a, a high quality product will therefore be thinking about product integrity and values-based um, purchasing or ethics-based purchasing decisions. What's happened is technology has made almost all consumers equal, whether that's um, a very uh, high net worth person living in Malcolm Turnbull's electorate in Sydney, or whether that's somebody in Lagos uh, in, in Nigeria. You know, technology has helped to make nearly all of us equal, particularly the rise and the rise of the smartphone and how we can all find out more about the products we have. Uh, and just an example there from WeChat. The example here with the Ben and Jerry's ice cream just goes to highlight that how your product presents itself online, in social media, um, mo uh, mobile devices is almost, almost as important as the product experience. So here uh, on, the, uh, on uh, your left hand side, my right, is um, Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Um, it's got a lid on it. it, tells you a little bit about the product and that's how it used to appear online. And the owners of Ben and Jerry really started to think about this, this, these great expectations, this desire for transparency and traceability. And they did something really, really small. They um, increased the descriptor, so what was the product? But more importantly, when they displayed the product in social media and in e-commerce, they took the lid off. They showed consumers what was in the product. Very, very simple example, but for a, uh, that was the only change they made in their marketing mix. No change in price, no other change in the promotional vehicles. They just exposed the product and received that type of uh, sales uplift. So again, just an example of that trend in practice. So the third mega trend is called the Silk Highway. So what we know, and we're experiencing this right now, is that current decades and indeed coming decades will see the world economy shift from west to east and north to south rapid income growth in Asia and to a lesser extent, South America and Africa will see billions of people transition out of poverty and into the middle income classes. The powerhouses of this new world economy are China and India and this economic shift will build new markets, trade relations, business models and cultural ties for Australia. Now we get really excited, with, oh, billions of people transitioning out of poverty, poverty, many, many markets. Yes, population size is important, but it's important to remember, certainly for the Australian beef industry, we're actually still quite a small producer on the global scale. We do have finite supplies of red meat and we need to identify the single best products for our market. So population is one consideration. And I just encourage you to keep your eyes on China, okay? So this is 2015 data, population size. So population size is important. But actually what's just as important when you're actually a small producer like Australia is actually understanding which markets have the ability to afford or who have the ability to purchase our product. So when it comes to um, protein, we know there is a very, very strong correlation between higher income growth and the ability uh, to afford protein and consume protein regularly in the, in the diet. Our proxy uh, on average is US $35,000 per annum. So that's the average household income at which we know protein is regularly consumed. So here, there are no, this is the number of households in a country which, uh, which is earning more than US $35,000 per annum. So today, or well, back in 2015, you get an idea that these are the number of households who can regularly afford a product like Australian beef. That's 7.8 million households in China. Uh, that's uh, smaller than Korea, which is our third largest export market. 
and a little bit smaller than Australia. But it's also about understanding how this will change because this certainly guides the red meat industry in terms of what type of product, how do we position it, which markets do we need to explore. And what you can actually see here is by 2020, so in just five short years with this data set, there'll be more households in, in China, uh, uh, affluent households, not middle income, affluent households who can afford a product, a uh, high quality product uh, from Australia. So very, very important when we're thinking about uh, the investments we, we need to make in the industry. But countries are one thing. What's even more important uh, for the Australian red meat industry and the beef industry is actually to understand we can't, even, we can't even feed whole countries. We need to just drill down again. The devil is in the detail. Yes, it's about identifying attractive countries, attractive in terms of population, attractive uh, in terms of uh, afford, uh, who can afford our product, but it's about identifying attractive cities. And in this instance, we're just looking at GDP per capita. Uh, these are 20, uh, 2015 data. But it just gives you an idea of the sort of cities we need to target with a high quality beef product. Um, now we have this type of data for over 150 cities. And on behalf of industry, we share this with uh, major pastoral groups, brand owners, really helping them to identify the most attractive opportunities for their particular product. So a little bit about the mega trend, the Silk Road, and really what we're seeing the opportunities might be for the Australian beef industry. So my fourth trend is for forever young. So Australia, oh, okay, that's this one. Uh, so Australia and many other countries that make up the Organisation for Economic Development and Corp uh, Corporate Economic Cooperation and Development, or OEDC countries, have ageing populations. Now, there are some challenges associated uh, with an ageing population and the associated demographic trends. Now, in a market like Australia, which is where we produce our Australian beef, this actually includes a widening, widening retirement savings gap and rapidly escalating healthcare expenditure. Uh, this will have implications for the structure and the function of the labour market, but actually also has implications uh, for spending. So I mentioned up front that Australia remains the single largest market for the Australian beef industry. Now, Australia is a really good example to look at when we think about this mega trend of uh, forever young. So almost 20% of our population is forecast to be over 65 years of age by 2025, and expenditure patterns by household are also changing. Now, our other major export markets are walking down this path too. Japan, Korea, China and some much faster than others, such as Japan. So there are some implications. We do have a wonderful natural product in beef, but it's really, really important that we link some of the benefits, uh, uh, the health benefits and the benefits of a natural product and exploring value added opportunities that particularly meet the needs of an older, uh, an older, uh, an older person and also wealthier consumers. And these things will become very, very important in the years ahead. Probably the other implication is in a market like Australia, 60% of our beef is sold in retail. So principally through the major supermarket chains, uh, independent retailers or, or butchers. But 40% is consumed through food service. So this um, uh, point here around health expenditure will overtake restaurant and hotel spend by 2020 does have implications for the Australian beef industry. Food service sector is a very high value, seg very high value segment for, the, for, uh, for Australian beef. So my last mega trend is called fear, uncertainty and doubt. Now this all started with the events of September 11, 2001, when uh, certainly the West was, was, uh, was, was rocked by those events. And just as we were beginning to recover our confidence, uh, we had the global financial crisis. And that's been followed by, a, I guess, a series of shocks, um, whether that's the election of uh, President Trump, uh, I guess the surprise result with Brexit, um, ongoing failures uh, with institutions. Think about the Royal Banking Commission here in Australia. Um, and even when it comes to food, food safety scares. So this, when the world starts to feel a little bit out of control, individuals often start to want to retreat from the big picture they, are, they have high, growing levels of, of, of mistrust and they want to focus on where they can exercise control, typically over everyday choices. And when it comes to food, 
they want to be able to trust the choices that they make. Okay. So a simple proxy in a world where you're not quite sure what to trust, um, a simple proxy has actually become country of origin. So here's a question we asked through our, our, our own tracker. Um, what are you looking for on, on beef packaging? And this is a, it's a combined uh, top two box score where we saw the answer, I'm, you know, uh, where people were saying, I'm looking for country of origin, okay? So country of origin um, is a guide. It's a clue to the food safety, certification and general integrity systems uh, that support a product uh, and support for food safety. Do what I want it to. There we go. We feel very, very fortunate um, in the Australian beef industry. We actually feel very well placed to address this trend, particularly around country of origin. Um, there are three key, three key pillars or, or reasons I say that we're well, we're well placed. The first one is, is that there's something really, really, really good about being a long way from many other countries and being an island continent. Um, our natural, uh, the fact that we are an island gives us a uh, natural protection against, uh, against uh, 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 water protection and, bio and biosecurity. We are disease free uh, in a way many of the other global, uh, global producers have not been. We have a very large country which gives our cattle plenty of space to roam and that's increasingly important for a growing number of consumers. Uh, and we're a big country with a very, very diverse climate. And that can actually be a real strength when you think about supplying big customers like McDonald's globally or Sainsbury in the UK or Coles and Woolworths here in Australia. A very diverse climate will typically be a, a strong guide for all rounds or year round supply and continuity of supply. So that's very, very important. So we believe we have the ideal home. We also believe we deliver very, very well on peace of mind. So I spoke about in a world where there is fear, uncertainty and doubt. You know, consumers want peace of mind. So we have uh, in the Australian uh, beef industry, we talk about our integrity systems. Uh, and this is a combination of, of our identification systems uh, for, uh, for uh, individual traceability for, each, um, well, for, all, for all cattle, our food safety and our quality controls. In addition with our peace of mind, uh, we do have livestock production assurance models. So practices are that producers um, uh, record on farm to give um, assurance around um, the uh, ethical uh, and the animal wealth, the animal wealth, uh, animal welfare credentials. And this type of information is very important. Uh, producers cannot transact cattle without recording. Uh, the types of treatment uh, that the animal uh, that, that is, uh, has been part of the care of the animal. We have been quite unique on the world stage that we do have this individual traceability. We have that for principally for biosecurity reasons, but it actually is a really, really important part of this, this peace of mind. I guess the last part um, is a more emotional reason as to why we feel we're very well placed to meet these uh, mega trends. We do have a wonderful natural product. Um, and a product that makes a diversity of healthy, delicious uh, red meat products. They are appreciated the world over, as I mentioned, export, exported to many, many countries with many cuts that suits many cuisine types. We have grass fed beef, we have grain fed beef, and of course, they all exhibit high quality iron, protein, and zinc. Uh, so just in export markets, the way we bring all that together uh, is through a brand called True Aussie. Uh, that un that's our um, overall trust mark. And then individual um, brand owners um, will use that as a platform from which to then uh, market their own, uh, their own particular brand, their own provenance stories, any particular differences they might have in their own, uh, in their own production system. So wrapping up that session there on uh, megatrends, these trends suggest there are both threats and opportunities for Australian beef. And what's critical as an industry is that we continue to monitor these trends, uh, not, not just looking backwards, looking forwards and making some assumptions. And we need to adapt uh, our policies and our practices, and we need to innovate if we're to realise the current and future demand. So I'm just going to quickly whiz into the little last part of the presentation. I'm going to look at something that should be familiar to all of us, which is the domestic market or the Australian market. So 
What do we know about the Australian market? I mentioned it is the single most valuable for beef. Uh, we typically export 70% of our beef, so we are consuming 30% uh, in the Australian market. Australian is characterised by a growing number of smaller households, so one to two person households. Uh, often linked with the fact we have an ageing an aging population and we have those smaller households. The other thing that's happening is um, smaller households are leading to smaller houses, smaller apartments, smaller kitchens. You might only have one or two hot plates in a, in a kitchen in an apartment. That has really big implications, believe it or not, for our cuts, our cut size, how we package our product, the portion sizes. So smaller households is really important. Australia um, has one of the highest uh, participation rates of, uh, of women, in the, women in the workforce amongst some of our key export markets. Uh, but what we are seeing is um, two-person working households. So the implication here is we are time poor. In fact, I don't meet too many Australians who wouldn't describe themselves as time poor. They want healthy, tasty and convenient meal solutions. They don't want to cut, they want a meal solution. So there's quite a, quite a distinction there. We've got growth in eating out, um, back to being time poor. If it all gets too hard, um, well, two things can happen. It's usually pretty easy for people in the metropolitan areas to, to go and e eat out. But actually the rise and rise of the on-home delivery services is really starting to make some inroads. Uh, so people are eating out or they're eating out at home. But that's been um, amazing growth. And when we're looking at the volumes moving through uh, those home delivery channels, it's been quite extraordinary in a, sh in a short period of time. Uh, and just to give you an idea, the average family eats out two to three times a week. So Australians are, 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 you know, eat out a lot. So with um, these really, really busy families or households, this other thing has happened, which is the rise and the rise of the unplanned shop. So think back, you know, to when you were growing up or maybe think back to your grandparents. Typically, mum, because mum used to do it, would write a shopping list. She would do a big shop once a fortnight um, and maybe do a little bit of uh, a little bit of top up shopping. OK, so there was maybe one big shop a fortnight and then, a you know, a weekly shop. And maybe the milkman used to deliver the milk and you, and you got some fresh bread. But that was it. Things are really, really different now. Um, we are finding the average uh, the average Australian living in a metropolitan area is going to the supermarket five to six times a week. And actually, the other thing that is happening, so these are lots and lots of small baskets. Everybody's spending a little bit more than they used to, by the way, because it's really easy to just put that one more thing in the basket. Retailers love it. Uh, but what this is, because they're shopping so frequently, we're seeing a decline in meal planning. So if you think back to the way it used to be, even if you were doing a big shop once a week, you had to think ahead. What were you going to cook? Uh, and you're writing, you're writing a list. What's happening now is we're actually saying that 35% of the evening meal or the main meal, it's not being planned until 4 p.m. So if you've got some cuts, you know, curious cuts or cuts that need to be cooked for a little bit longer, you can actually see that's a pretty big implication for, for beef. You know, big part of my job, we've got a great, uh, you know, uh, we've got a great carcass, is to find a home for every part of that carcass. In a market like Australia, um, some of the cuts need a longer and slower cooking time. And you can actually see how that would be counter to a trend such as this. Um, chicken is winning, really winning in this space. Um, if, you, if you're not sure what to do um, and you haven't got much time, you know, it is winner, winner, chicken dinner. So uh, absolutely the case, we're really seeing that. Now our ageing population, uh, as I mentioned, presents all sorts of opportunities and challenges. The challenges are in the taste and the, and the texture um, and, and eating, eating beef. But new opportunities in Australia, of course, um, many older Australians or elderly Australians do go into the nursing home environment and that's presenting some significant opportunities uh, for Australian beef. Last but not least, we have a really, really diverse population. Um, you know, just by way of example, one third of Sydney ciders were born outside of, uh, were born outside of Australia. So it just gives you an idea um, that beef, which may, uh, beef and lamb in particular, for, uh, that were just so frequent on Australian dinner plates 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, um, with you know, people who are joining Australia from parts of Southeast Asia, beef is a much smaller part of their protein repertoire. It's typically pork or chicken, 
even plant-based proteins. So again, it does represent some challenges uh, for beef. Um, it is not uh, it is uh, not as important part of uh, per capita consumption, overall protein consumption as it used to be uh, in the Australian diet. So the big one, uh, when we think about Australia, is uh, consumer needs. Uh, we have a situation, and we were, we were the rock star on the world stage going back uh, last decade with respect to our GDP performance. But actually, we're currently experiencing um, very stagnant um, GDP, and the outlook is quite soft. Now, food is the second largest cost and it is growing fast. So we have this challenge. It is a beautiful, high quality product. Our beef, you've heard me say that multiple times. Beef runs at a four times price per, uh, price per kilo premium to chicken. Okay, so four times. You, you would all know that if you, if you buy beef or if you look at the meat cabinet, you'll see that beef typically runs at a significant premium to chicken and also to pork. So this is a real challenge. We've got these busy Australians, they're making all sorts of trade-offs um, around convenience, etc. but they're also trying to balance the household budget. So the challenge we have in the single biggest market is to demonstrate that beef is worth paying more for. So it's not just taste and texture and sensory experience, um, but also aligning with some of those other uh, purchase considerations I raised earlier. So if you can do these sorts of presentations and you're all kind of sitting back going, that's interesting, but is it real? Are these trends actually being reflected uh, in terms of consumer behaviour? So what I have here, uh, MLA uh, since 2010 runs what we call a community and consumer sentiment tracker. And what we're seeking to understand is all sorts of um, perceptions around the industry um, and how that's influencing our preferences uh, for products and purchasing behaviour. So we're trying to understand, we, we always ask the question, are you eating more red meat, less red meat, or the same amount as you were 12 months ago? Uh, and uh, you, can, you can see the, da the data set there over the last day, and looking at that trend. So the single biggest reason, so this is when people are forced, if, if you're eating less red meat now, than you were 12 months ago, what's the single biggest reason why? And you can see the fact that the product is too expensive is, is by far the single biggest reason. Human health concerns, the role of red meat uh, and beef as part of Ballot's diet remains the second biggest reason. But I spoke about ethics-based purchasing decisions. Now this is all Australians. Um, you know, we can cut the data by life stage and it does look a little bit more, uh, it does look a little different for younger consumers. But the, concerned about the treatment of animals, um, it's small, but it, it, it is growing, and that's quite a, that's quite significant growth in in my opinion. And our environmental impact is also there, but it's um, it's a smaller it's a smaller consideration. So I've mentioned young people a few times, and that they have uh, they're really leading this trend in ethics based purchasing decisions. So whether that's concern around environmental impact or animal welfare. But in Australia, women actually are the ones with the greatest concerns. They have significant concerns around animal welfare and the impact of, of production on the environment. Uh, so 30% of women are saying, you know what, I have concerns. I have concerns about animal welfare with respect to beef production. And younger women are more concerned again. Nearly 40% of younger women have concerns around beef. Uh, probably less so the impact on the environment Though there are state differences, um, I'm uh, living up here in, uh, in Brisbane, I see there are quite um, a, gr uh, a larger number of women in Brisbane have concerns about grazing and its impact on the environment, uh, implications uh, uh, around the reef. Uh, that's a much greater concern here in Brisbane. In Melbourne, um, really uh, much more concern around animal welfare. And the animal welfare concerns, um, when we drill down into this, are principally linked to road transport, uh, so at livestock being, uh, being moved through road transport, uh, but also linked to the live export industry, uh, particularly um, sheep meat. So that's sort of the environment that we're, that we're working in. And at the same time, uh, we're finding that those in metropolitan areas are becoming increasingly detached from producers and farms. And this is a little bit hard to see, but the question here is, have you ever visited, visited, visit? a cattle or a sheep farm. 
And we can actually see that number is declining year on year on year in the survey. Apologies, I don't have the 2018 data there, but it's around the same. Around 37% have never visited a farm. Why this is important, I was speaking about this um, move towards ethics-based purchasing or choosing a brand or a product where you feel there's values alignment. And if we go back a generation or two, most people knew a producer or a farmer. He was an uncle or a grandfather or someone you knew. And you probably had an opportunity to go out to the farm. Uh, you probably also had an opportunity to, you know, to know your uncle or your, or, or your grandparent. And you could understand a little bit more about why they would make some of the choices that they did. The reality is, you know, less and less people know a producer. Um, so it is really hard to connect on that values level or to at least start a conversation about some of those tricky areas, particularly around uh, animal husbandry, for example. And all of this is in an environment where social media uh, has, and social channels have given interest groups a much bigger voice. Uh, certainly from uh, the red meat industry's perspective, we like to work really, really happy. We like to work as closely as possible um, with the NGOs and particularly those who are happy to work with industry. And really what's so important in working with groups like the RSPCA, we see those tracking results and that tells us what, but it doesn't help us understand why. And what I'm really passionate about, I spoke about the why up front, I want to try and understand what is acceptable to the community because just because something's legal or it's in regulation doesn't mean it's in step with community expectations. So it's really, really important for industries like the beef industry to have really open dialogue with those um, who want to work with us and to help us understand how could we close that gap between community expectations and practice. Um, some of those groups, the activist groups, um, they don't believe in um, uh, animal protein. So it's really, really hard for us to work with those groups uh, and, and connect with them. And uh, you know, they're certainly increasingly sophisticated in terms of their, uh, their, their actions uh, and their attacks on the industry. So how does an industry like the Australian beef industry compete in this complex env environment? First and foremost, it absolutely starts with, we have a commitment to good and improving practices in everything we do. And research and development are absolutely key to help us identify best practice. And examples of some research programs uh, that help us win in this complex environment with all those, uh, all of those trends. Um, if we think about environment and we think about um, methane and methane reduction, R&D projects um, to help us identify better, better, um, better feed, uh, such as Lekina, uh, that can actually help reduce methane emissions. There are vaccinations uh, that we're looking at that can help reduce methane, addition, um, methane emission in cattle. There's actually certain breeds that actually naturally produce uh, less methane. And then there are a whole range of on-farm practices uh, such as uh, some of the savannah burning. Uh, again, all these things can help, can help us, uh, not only with uh, methane reduction, but more generally uh, carbon, carbon emissions. Thinking about um, animal welfare, the types of research and development initiatives that are really important for our industry. Um, pain relief, there will be some procedures um, that are, we believe are absolutely essential to the health uh, of the cattle. Um, but if, uh, what's important is that pain relief is administered um, and making sure that we do have pain relief that can be easily administered and is of course very, very effective. Uh, for those cattle uh, that are in uh, the grain, the grain fed production system, just understanding that we do have some very, very good early indicators um, uh, of, uh, of, of illness uh, and we can uh, look after those animals as, as quickly as possible. So early detection, early detection systems. Uh, there's looking at genes uh, and uh, the pole gene, uh, rather than having to undertake a practice like dehorning, are there actually cattle? Uh, that can be bred, uh, bred without, without that. So a bit of a pick and mix there, but just to give you an idea that research and development is absolutely critical to help us identify best practice. And of course, research and development is, is great, but it needs to be underpinned by adoption and extension programs. So big country, 
many, many producers uh, ensuring that we do have those programs in place to ensure uh, that uh, those programs are adopted by the production sector. And, and of course, I mean, I haven't touched on processing sector today, but of course there are um, opportunities there, particularly around uh, waste and water management in, uh, in the processing sector. And last but not least, uh, it's around consumer and community <coughs> engagement. Um, I mentioned up front, sometimes when you see those headlines, you want to attack back or you feel the need to defend. Uh, increasingly more and more of our job is to listen and to understand why, what's driving the outrage for some consumers or what's driving the concern for other consumers and how can we better, better meet their expectations. So in closing, um, thank you for allowing me uh, to share with you a few insights around the Australian beef industry. Um, if nothing else, I hope you walk away to today understanding there are some global mega trends. Uh, while I've focused on the Australian beef industry, these are big mega trends, they impact all industries. Um, they're real, um, sustainability is real, uncertainty is real, and uh, those great expectations are absolutely real. They do represent opportunities and threats, and are on those particular areas around human nutrition, the environment, animal health and welfare. This is an industry that needs to continue to commit to good policy, practices that, it, that demonstrate adherence to policy, and of course those programs. And I haven't touched on it much today, but increasingly those, you, you know, you'll read around uh, Australia is currently in the process of negotiating a, uh, a new free trade agreement with the European Union. What we're finding increasingly is these types of practices, particularly around um, uh, stewardship of the natural resource space and animal welfare, is actually starting to find its way uh, into some of those market access arrangements. So they're very, very important. And on human nutrition, we're actually also seeing that the impact of, uh, of uh, uh, production on the environment is something that policymakers are considering when they think about dietary guidelines. So getting this right, is absolutely mission critical. We know that technology and social media has given a greater voice to consumers. They can rightly so find out more about production practices and, and, uh, and, and the types of claims that are being made. Equally, it is giving that greater voice to interest groups and also activists. We know that consumers want to know more and more about where their food, the food they eat and where it has come from. And we know that there is demand and growing demand for natural product and for protein, and that demand is strong in both developed and developing markets. And we do anticipate, despite some of those headwinds, that beef records will continue to, trump, to tumble. I guess we feel we're well positioned uh, to meet consumer needs, but it, you know, it, all, it all starts with closing that gap between community expectations and practice. And certainly for us, research adoption and extension are critically important. So. Thank you.